So I, um, I, I come from a family of teachers. My, my parents were teachers. My brother and sister, uh, two brothers, sister have been teachers. And so it was kind of natural for me to fall into that. Um, I started teaching when I was uh, 19. So I've, I've had many years in teaching, but I was uh, uncomfortable with it right from the start. Uh, after three years, I, I quit. Uh, that's what a, a lot of young teachers do. They leave within the first five years feeling that it's not the way they want to spend their lives. And so I, I was one of those teachers. I left after three and uh, went traveling, tried to figure out what I want to do with my life. So I, I was about your age at the time. And um, when I looked around, I, I felt like, like you feel that we're in a very capitalistic society and and other options, things you might want to do. Uh, there are just not that many things that don't seem to perpetuate something that you would like to change. So I ended up back in teaching. Uh, it was um, a long journey of, uh, of sorting things out and deciding uh, the philosophy, like uh, change what you can change, accept what you can't. And it takes a, a bitter man to try to live outside history. So I returned to teaching with that in mind, trying to do as, as little damage as I could. And, and then sorting out what, what to me was um, the, the right role, best role that I could play with, with kids at the time, minimize the damage that I was doing. So that's, um, that's where my journey has been and, and why I started uh, reimagining education. Yes, the, um, the journey that I was on uh, resulted in me having to unlearn a, a lot of things. And, and one of the, the most major unlearning things I had to do was, um, was to stop distrusting myself. The school system had me thinking that, that for me to succeed, I had to do things their way. And as I learned more, I gained more confidence in myself. The, the school system had kind of shattered my confidence that I knew what was best for myself. And I had to relearn that uh, I could trust myself to pursue what I wanted to pursue, that I wasn't the lazy person. I, I was only lazy when I was forced to do things I didn't want to do. And, and so I had all of that unlearning to do and to realize that that we can trust young people. Something that, that was a big influence for me was uh, George Leonard's book, Education and Ecstasy. It was published in 1968. And um, he said, starting off the book, something that I've, I've never forgotten, that teaching is an exacting and exhausting business, this damming up the flood of human potentiality. And that I felt strongly that in my teaching role, I, I was preventing uh, students from flourishing. I was trying to contain them into what society thought was the, the perfect child and instead of letting children develop to their best ability, best of their ability in their own way. And uh, so that was, um, that was very informative. Leonard had a scenario of the, um, the school that, that he envisioned at the time, which was very similar to a, a Sudbury Valley type school where students had a, a lot of control over their learning. They were uh, free to develop along the lines that they wanted to develop. Uh, I couldn't understand it at the time because I, I had that distrust in myself and consequently distrust that other students would just waste their time if, if they were given choice over what they learned. So I had all of that to, to figure out and in the process uh, became aware of, of Sudbury Valley School and, and Summer Hill and, and that kind of thinking, Peter Gray's work and realized uh, what authors like um, Carl Rust today are saying, uh, just to, to back off, let, let students be. And, and that to me is, is where I'm at in education now. It's, it's the 
image of young people directing their own learning, uh, full confidence that they will learn all that they need to know for life in their culture if they're just left to their own devices that they'll flourish so that's that's where i'm at i don't have questions about the kind of learning environment that we need to provide for students i just um, have questions about how we we get the public to to recognize it most people that we speak to still have uh, virtually no recognition no idea of of this alternative way of doing education they're still stuck where i was when when i first started looking at the problem the uh, distrust of myself uh, as i mentioned the um the whole idea that that i could trust myself that i was um a person capable of pursuing learning by my own design in this uh, society and that a lot of what we were being forced to learn did not promote uh, student flourishing the flourishing of people what it did was it it uh, cramped them it contained them and so it was that that situation that Leonard described so nicely as damming up the flood of human potentiality. I, I unlearned that schools had this, uh, uh, what you might call vision of how to develop people uh, for their, their greatest potential. Rather, it was, um, it's more a system that's uh, designed to make workers. It was designed for that purpose that uh, it, um, was developed to create uh, obedient, docile people because they're more easily managed and, and you can make them do the things you want them to do. That's not human flourishing and that's uh, ultimately not good for society. You end up with people who feel disengaged, don't participate and, uh, and the world begins to, to collapse as we see with Zach Stein's warnings at this time. The Youth Rights Day idea grew out of the, the statement by some youth that we are the generation we've been waiting for. I had been working towards change for a long time, but that, uh, that comment really struck because youth are, are wanting change at a faster rate than adults seem to be able to, to manage it. And so they, they're exerting a pressure for us to respond in a, a timely way to major uh, world problems. And, and so from that perspective, it seemed like, like we need to focus on youth as, as the change agents that we need to address serious world problems. And, and not to the exclusion of adults. They, they obviously need adults for um, support and also um, the guidance of of the adults not necessarily that the the adults should be making the big decisions uh, they've lived in a, a different time they've got a different perspective youth have a a more modern perspective because of the the years that they've lived and so it, we need to be in this together we need to be working as uh, partners in this so although i i like that saying that youth are the generation we've been waiting for. Uh, it's certainly not meant to exclude adults from uh, playing a, a really important part in that. The Youth Rights Day itself is uh, the, the problem that we face and we've seen it with other uh, movements is that uh, we're too disconnected to accomplish the things that we we most want to accomplish the um they say that about environmental problems that the reason environmental groups haven't made more progress uh, addressing climate change is that they're too disconnected and when you look at the people who are fighting for for youth that they be treated as as equal citizens that they be respected as as people just like anybody it's it's the root of of equality if we can't treat children 
as equals, if we have to discriminate against them on the basis of age, then we're basically setting ourselves up for a, a society that's going to be in turmoil. And we're seeing that that's the case. So uh, we've got to get united. There are all sorts of groups that are, are working. Uh, I keep learning about more of them just this past week, new groups coming to my attention that, that I'm thinking, well, if, if we can just get ourselves united, organized in some way, that we keep doing all the good stuff we're doing, but we're somehow or other connected, then, then we can get to that tipping point where we cannot be made invisible. We will be so visible that people are going to have to start addressing the, the concerns that we bring forward. And so how do we do that? How can we unite in a way that, that doesn't take away from the work that people are already doing, that doesn't cost anybody anything, but that, that really raises worldwide awareness of, of what we're, we're trying to accomplish. And if we can do that together in some way, then we, we become a force. Uh, that's what the, the Youth Rights Day is to be. It's to be a festival showcasing all the, the good things that youth and their supporters are doing. It can be activist work, or it can just be uh, the way that, that they're able to find joy if they're free to follow their interests. And so the examples of, of people flourishing, young people flourishing, let's bring them out on uh, Youth Rights Day. Let's bring out the examples of, of people who are fighting for change like yourself and, and Yamna and um, Zaneb, uh, such good spokespeople for, for youth and to win the confidence of adults that, that we need to be listening to youth, that their, their voice matters. And so that's, that's the idea of Youth Rights Day. And for myself, I, I'm focused on the, the Ottawa community. The uh, Ottawa is the capital of Canada. And I wanna get people in, in Ottawa uh, working together, uniting the people of Ottawa in this idea of, um, of it takes um, a village to raise a child. And so the whole city uh, respecting youth as, as equal human beings, children and youth as equal human beings and, and working together to make our, our city and our, our society a, a much more promising place to be living. And uh, if there's a, a worldwide movement, other cities, other communities that are in large numbers celebrating youth on this particular day, it really empowers me in Ottawa to, to do more, to get more attention to to the whole idea of respecting youth as, as equal human beings and, and celebrating what they have to, to bring to making the world better. And if, if I were left alone to just try to create that, that mood within Ottawa, I, I'm, I'm not nearly uh, as well positioned to have an effect as if there's a, a worldwide movement where we have large enough numbers that we've we've hit the tipping point and people are now saying that that this is serious we we need to be looking at this so my work with the youth rights day is is really to empower myself at the local level and if we empower enough people at the local level that's when that that saying work local go global becomes a reality referred to the idea of uh, it taking a village to raise a child and and that's essentially what I see as um, the idea of a community learning hub and so my my vision of where education needs to go is is the idea of a community learning hub it it ties in a little bit to what Peter Gray said uh, in looking at libraries and his library project the um, he identifies um, two public institutions that are, are uh, funded for, for public education. 
uh, one of them being the public school system, the other being public libraries. And he defines them saying that, that public education is forced learning for ages um, K to 12, and that libraries are self-directed learning uh, for people uh, ages uh, from cradle to grave. And so you think of the difference between walking into a library and walking into a school. You walk into a school and right away you feel you're being controlled, that you have to do what other people are requiring you to do. You walk into a library and you feel like you can ask the question, can you help me with what I want to learn? And so the, the learning community would be that. You could still have your, your central uh, buildings like schools where people go, but they walk into them more like their, their libraries and they're not contained within the walls of that institution. They, the entire community becomes their, their, learning, uh, their learning environment. And we need to start looking at, at applying computers to learning the way Zach Stein has uh, indicated. And, and that is uh, that you use them to connect people. You don't use them to dispense information. And, and that's not to rule out using them as, uh, as courses. But uh, so just to comment on that for a moment, the, the uh, uh, Khan Academy, that type of course, if somebody has something specific that they want to learn, and there's a course that will take them through it quickly, step by step, and they want to learn that way, then by all means, that, that self-directed learning, you are the architect of, of your learning. You choose the learning resources that, that work best for you. So this self-directed learning does not rule out courses, but the, the Zach Stein vision is using computers to connect people. So you, you have a, the example is a, a dating app, dating app trying to connect people that have uh, particular interests. And, and so then the idea of, of a learning app that connects people that, that have uh, certain interests, so that uh, learning interests. So if somebody is, um, let's just say a chess master and somebody in the, the community that they may have as a neighbor even, uh, wants to, to learn chess, a computer program uh, could be created that would match those people up, that you would be able to just search the, the app for somebody in your neighborhood who is a, a chess master and, and hook up that way. Chess uh, might not be a good example because um, there are chess clubs and, and other ways to connect with, with chess, but um, just maybe auto mechanics, you want to fix your your uh, car in some way and you get on the internet and, and you match up with somebody who could show you how to do that. Maybe come over to your house, maybe do it virtually, but that that you're um, you're connecting for for personal learning experiences with with people, not with machines. Uh, that would be the the use that I see for computers. A lot of opportunity to get outdoors and enjoy nature, just just free to pursue what you want. And the elimination of, of um, timetables and uh, age segregations, formal timetables, you still need to, to arrange meeting times and that with people, but uh, formal, formally scheduled school days that have people march to the bells and age segregation, if we really want to maximize our learning environments, we need to get rid of those two constructs that are greatly inhibiting learning and they're also they're squandering a huge learning resource which is what young people have to learn from slightly older people and what slightly older people have to learn about compassion and caring for younger people how to convey what they know all of those communication skills so we're we're uh, having to uh, create communities that are not age segregated, not subject specific, and where you have uh, sparking uh, cultivated. 
So sparking is something that, that Wayne Jennings in his book, uh, Transforming Schools, describes as a, a student has a, a keen interest on something. And when you see him or her engaged with that, enjoying that learning, uh, it attracts the attention of other kids that, that they get sparked by it as well. And if you have kids that are, are free to learn whatever they want to learn, there can be this coming and going from the, the learning hub center, the school, if we want to call it that, uh, where students may go away for a day, a week, a month, learning something of interest. And then they come back to their, their school, this free learning environment, and they're going to be sparking all kinds of uh, other students with what they've learned. And that's where you get the, the broad look at education that Daniel Greenberg mentions, uh, the uh, bringing the real world to the attention of the kids. The, um, the students go out, they pursue all these varieties of interests, they bring them back to the school and, and you, you end up then with a, an engaged dynamic learning environment. That's the vision.